too want to thank uh, Dan and Megan Storkham for moving back to Florida and choosing New Smyrna Beach as their home. For oh, bringing Olivia with you, we appreciate that. What a blessing to be together this morning. Just want to remind you, church is over at 12.30. So I'd like everybody to stand up and shake hands with somebody you don't know or shake hands with somebody you know you're allowed to hug and kiss in this church. Please stand and greet each other. Oh, hey. unless you can't see this. Nice to see you. This nice man with black. Tribute to Johnny Cash. Could you 
be so kind to us. May our eyes and our ears be open today as we review, as we review and we remember what you've taught us long ago. We ask it in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Well, this is called the Panorama of Empires. And we would like to remind you that tonight we will be having Final Empire, which is at 7 o'clock. It's a wonderful uh, video that's presented by, of all people, Sean Winstra. And uh, then we have a little discussion of it. We go over a Bible study guide. Everyone has been enjoying it. If you've enjoyed it, would you raise your hand and maybe let somebody know that you were here and that you enjoyed it. So 7 o'clock, please try to come back this evening. Here we have, like I said, Bible 101, or Seventh-day Adventist 101. Where is the, what chapter of Daniel is this from? Eight. Two, Daniel 2. Ooh. And we have uh, Babylon being the head of gold. We have Medo-Persia being the head, arms and chest of silver. You've got Greece being the um, bronze, uh, legs and, uh, not legs and thighs, but sort of that. The, that area right there where it's covered. And um, we have Rome being the legs of iron. And then we have divided Europe, which was the iron and clay, which didn't stick together. I don't know if you ever did crafts when you tried to stick stuff together and it didn't stick. Not very fun. We didn't have Gorilla Glue back when I was a kid, but there I never had the patience to stick stuff together and wait for it to dry. I don't know, maybe it's still that way, but I do know that uh, these iron and clay is not sticking together. And those were the European nations, and it's just labeled here, Europe divided. Now we're going to go to a different chapter. And what chapter is this one from, somebody? Seven. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Chapter 7, the vision of the four beasts. And um, we have Babylon, Greece, we have uh, Medo-Persia, and we have the uh, beast that you, uh, indescribable beast. And it looks like a T-Rex, but it's uh, definitely, even T-Rex is supposed to be stretched out. You know, he's not supposed to be back up on his hind legs. They figured that out, <laughs> that he was not on his hind legs. Part two of this um, one is that there was the horn that came up, the little horn that came up, and um, and a little horn in the mouth that spoke blasphemous words against God, and that was the panorama of empires. Now we're back in Daniel 8, and we're going to ask ourselves a question. When did Daniel have the vision of Daniel 8? And it's awesome to me, if you are there in Daniel 8, you'll see right in verse 1 and 2. What's awesome to me is people knew what year they were doing things, they knew where the kings were, they kept records, they had timelines. It wasn't like they're primitive and, and nobody knows what happened back in those days. So right here in Daniel 8, verse 1 and 2, we know that in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So it is a time that they know when it was. Um, important to me because we are questioning today you know, why do I find the 2300 days prophecy important? Um, why do I care? And uh, I had a little smart question that I was going to put out there, but uh, I, I decided it might not be reverent. Just who cares? You know, who cares? And is it anything you need to care about? Is it anything I need to care about? Can I be a whole Christian and not care about the 2300 days? So. Uh, I think it's important that right there in the beginning of Daniel, we find it out that it was in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. And if we know when that started, we can know a lot about times. So looking at uh, this next part, in Daniel 8, 3 and 4, and you're right there looking at your Bible, I hope, you're going to see what kind of animal did Daniel see in vision that conquered in every direction. And it was a ram which had two horns, a ram which had two horns, and the question was, who does this ram represent? Does the Bible tell us? Well, check it out in Daniel chapter uh, 8, verse 20. It plainly says, the ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. 
Now, historians know when Media and Persia conquered the kingdom of Babylon. So, the kings of Media and Persia, they were a team at that point. They were on the same team. And there's Persia. I uh, happened to see, uh, be in a classroom the other day, and I showed them, uh, they were in a map, and I asked them, they were all studying about the Roman Empire. And I asked them to identify Italy on the map, that it was shaped like a boot, and they couldn't find it. <laughs> but we should be able to see that Italy and the Roman Empire is over there. That is the heel of the boot, there's the toe of the boot, and that's the long part of the boot. But we're talking about Persia and how far it went, all the way over to what would later be Constantinople, Istanbul, all the way here. Is this part near Israel? This is Africa? So this Persian Empire was quite extensive. And they had conquered the Babylonian Empire. Um, so what's the next animal that Daniel sees in this vision? And it's in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 5. So you're there. I'm there. Let's take a look and see. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So a male goat came from the west, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So what does the rough goat represent, and what does the great horn represent? Daniel 8, 21 again. Well, I was going to tell us what it's talking about. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn is that, that is between its eyes is the first king. So we have the kingdom of Greece, the goat equaling Greece. Now, question, the first horn, the first king. I'm going to look at my notes here for a second and see if there's anything we should really add to that. But who knows who the first king was in Greece? Paul, oh, PDP. Alexander the Great, thank you very much. He conquered uh, this whole Persian uh, empire. He was actually conquering the whole world so quickly that he got bored. He found himself not having much more to conquer. So Alexander the Great conquered the world in a very short period of time. At the age of 32, he died suddenly as a result of his own intemperance. The Grecian Empire, instead of uh, being taken over by one person, was divided into four separate kingdoms. So let's look at verse, uh, Daniel 8, verse 6 and 7. Daniel 8, verse 6 and 7. And it's beautiful that uh, our, one of our young men has already studied his prophecies. 6 and 7 says this, Then he came to the ram and had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with a furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So what are we talking about there? He conquered the ram, and the large horn was broken. And what came up in his place? This is the question. In its place were four notable ones came up. So the large arm was broken, which is symbolizing the Alexander the Great. And then four notable ones came up. Now, what's the meaning of the four horns that came up in Daniel 8, 22? The four horns are four kingdoms. Why is this important to me? Why is this important to you? The Bible in Daniel is foretelling history. I mean, we've already seen the, the, the Medo-Persians, and now we're seeing Greece described, we're seeing Alexander the Great described, we're seeing his four, his four uh, generals that, that he's described, and it's way before it happened. So this is predicting prophecy. So does it give you confidence in the Bible to know that God laid this out before it happened? If it gives you confidence, say amen. 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 It gives you confidence. So the Grecian Empire, instead of being taken over by one person, was divided into four separate kingdoms, and the kingdoms of Egypt, Thrace, Macedonia, and, and Syria. And these four kingdoms were ruled by four generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, Cassandra, and Seleucus. He did not have an heir. He died very young. He basically told his four generals, 
fight it out. And the Bible predicts it with these four horns. Remember that in Hebrew, the word horn also stands for power. You can see that very naturally. You, you think about where do you want to not be when a ram is uh, running at you. You don't want to be on the, on the horn end of the story, right? You want to be far away from that. So Hebrews, horns, power, power, four kingdoms. So what does Daniel see coming up out of one of the four winds of heaven? And now we're going to see something even a little more interesting. In verse 8, or I mean chapter 8, verse 9, it says this. I'm hoping you're looking down at your Bible also. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And so we see a little horn coming up. Now, who does this little horn stand up against? In Daniel 8, verse 23 and 25, we're going to take a look at that. And we're just reading the Bible today. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the who? Prince of princes. But he shall be broken without human means. So here we have a description of a very fierce king that's described as a small horn. So here in these verses, Daniel 8, uh, Daniel 8, 8 through 12, we're actually going to see the pagan Rome evolving into a papal Rome. So what was fierce here, rising against the prince of, prince of princes. Who is the prince of princes? Oh, you can say it louder than that. Jesus. On your mark, it said, who is the Prince of Princes? Jesus. Thank you for responding. It just makes me know that you're, we're all here together. The Prince of Princes is obviously a reference to Jesus Christ. The power here described as the little horn stood up in opposition to Jesus Christ himself. The power that crucified Christ was the pagan what? Roman Empire. The pagan Roman Empire. And the next umpire in the sequence of empires foretold in the book of Daniel. Remember, we saw it was Babylon, we saw it was Medo-Persia, we saw it was Greece, and now we see it's Rome. And at this point, the little horn in Daniel 8 was none other than the pagan Roman Empire. So we have, we have the pagan Roman Empire when Christ was crucified, but it's evolving into papal Rome. Um, that's one of the things that the kids were studying is that uh, Constantine actually decided to uh, move his empire across the way over to Constantinople, which was uh, Byzantium and uh, Istanbul, and, uh, and he set his Roman Empire up over there just across that little peninsula of water that separates Asia from Europe. So, our question is, did the little horn stay a little horn? But mind you, Constantine is in the 300s, and we're back here uh, in the Roman Empire now. Daniel 8, verse 10, and I hope that you get this part. Um, the question is, um, how, did the little horn stay a little horn? And do we have any proof whether it did or didn't? 8, verse 10. It says, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So here we have this horn growing. And as it's saying it grew up, it's going to get more or less power. More power. It grew up. And as the little horn grew up, what five things did it do? And this is really important. This is going to help us know what the uh, reformers used those in the Reformation, what did they use to help identify this little horn, and why was there a Reformation? In verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. 
and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he did, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. He exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. He cast truth down to the ground. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he cast truth to the ground. He did all this and he prospered. He was not punished. He wasn't destroyed. He prospered. So here we have all this thing, all these things happening that, that God is predicting in Daniel 8, verse 11 and 12. So obviously we're not just dealing with the Roman Empire. In the latter days of the Roman Empire, the little horn changed its form and it became a religious political power that cast down the truth of God to the ground. It practiced and prospered and destroyed the truth of God's sanctuary. And in the, in the, in the sequence of Daniel 7, the next power after pagan Rome is papal Rome. Daniel 8 uses the same symbol to represent both powers, indicating the connection between papal Rome and pagan Rome. Likewise, Daniel 7 indicates that the little horn grew out of the dragon. Thus, the little horn in Daniel 8 represents Rome in its two stages of papal or pagan first, and then papal Rome. Were the emperors worshipped in Rome? Were the Roman emperors worshipped? Were there Christians that were sent to the uh, lion's den and the uh, gladiators because they refused to put that little pinch of incense to worship the emperors? How close or how little did it take to move the uh, worship of the emperors to, to the exaltation of one person over the whole Christian empire? It was such a smooth transition to have one person that would be exalted over the whole uh, Christian church. And at that time, mind yourself, mind, like we've been talking about on the final empire, that there wasn't a lot of choices if you were a Christian where you were going to go to church. Was there? There really weren't a lot of choices. There was basically one church, and it had some headquarters in Rome. Now we know that in other places, like where Thomas went when he went to India, they kept the Sabbath over there. We know that in uh, Ethiopia, the Coptic Christians understood the Sabbath. We know that even in Alexandria, that they did not worship on Sunday. They worshiped on the Sabbath. And as Marty likes to point out, that's where that sentence came from, that phrase, that uh, little cliche, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, because the Romans had converted Sunday, uh, worship from Sabbath over to the sun god Sunday. So there were places where people could have a different kind of religion, but eventually there was going to be only one choice pretty much everywhere. If you were in India, people were forced to become uh, Catholic. If you were in uh, Coptic Ethiopia, things changed. Even the story of St. Patrick on the island of uh, Ireland Different things happened where people were pretty much forced to have only one Christian religion. So this little horn definitely is to be reckoned with, and God gave us this warning in these scriptures. So I'm going to move along here as Daniel contemplates all that he has seen in this vision. What question was asked? And Brother Bree brought this out. We brought this out the last time we talked. How long will the vision be? How long until the vision is, it takes place, really? How long would it take before the sanctuary would be cleansed? And in Daniel 8, 14, which was our memory verse, and it's right there, right after verse 13, 13, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said unto me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Two thousand three hundred days. What's the title of our sermon today or our teaching? Why do I care about the twenty three hundred days prophecy? 
Why should you care? Because God cares, Brother Raymond Joseph says, because God cares. First, uh, question number 15, does the Bible support the use of a day for a year in Bible prophecy? And in Ezekiel uh, chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, I have laid on you a day for each year. Uh, Ezekiel was given a, uh, he was an object lesson and he had each day that he had to do something was for a year. Question uh, number 16, what is Daniel told about the vision of the evening and the morning? Well, in Daniel 8, verse 26, it says this. Uh, you're looking in your Bible? Please, I hope you've got a little yellow something to keep this in your mind as you go through this chapter 8 with me today. And the vision of the evening and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to right now. No. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So Daniel was told to seal up the vision, and it refers to many days in the future. So Daniel, did he understand what was going on with this 2300 day prophecy? Yeah. No. No. Uh, and the question is, why didn't God give Daniel an interpretation of the 2300 days at this time? He didn't give him an interpretation because it was for the future. I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. So, I can't even imagine. I imagine it was like a hallucinogenic experience for somebody to actually have some kind of, of vision. Uh, their, their, their brain was, was overwhelmed by, by not only the knowledge, but the presence of that angel. And here you have him just not knowing what's going to happen. He knows he knows by the description of this little horn that it's not good for God's people. He knows what the sanctuary is, and he knows that it's going to be trodden underfoot. And then he knows that it needs to be cleansed. But here he is, he's sick, and uh, he even fainted. Um, so what is Daniel doing when chapter 9 opens up? Well, you should be right there. We should be able to look in this, um, in this first and second verse. First through th third verse, but anyway. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of, Me of the Medes. So, Darius is one of the Mede kings, right? They know what time this is. They know their dates. They know who was where when. And the Bible reiterates, re reiterates it. And he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign. Daniel knows the time. Daniel's recording the time. Daniel knows the years. I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet had given some years a time prophecy that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Do you realize that Jerusalem was put in a timeout? They were put in a timeout. 70 years over in Babylon, you're going to have to learn a new language, new culture, you're going, to, you're going to be the odd guys. You were here in your homeland, you couldn't get it done, guess what? You're going away. And they went on their timeout. And Jeremiah, who was the prophet, who had kept warning them, kept asking them to, to ship, you know, shape up or ship out, they got shipped out. Daniel is making my prayer and supplication. I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We've done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, our righteousness belongs, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. So Daniel is making a prayer. So who appears to Daniel in answer to this prayer? Gabriel, whom I had seen in the beginning. And what's the purpose of Gabriel's visit this time? 
in Daniel chapter 9, verse 22 and 23, he says, I have come now, I have now come forth to give you a skill to understand. Consider the matter and understand the vision. There hadn't been any new vision since the vision of the 2300 days. And the 2300 days was the only thing not explained in chapter 8. The rest of the prophecy was explained. We had, we had countries, we had kings.